For Complex News, I'm Pierce Simpson. I'm joined here by the director of the Last Dance documentary that aired this past Sunday on ESPN. Jason Ayer, Jason, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been amazing to see you get Michael Jordan being so candid and just so out there. And a lot of times, a lot of people don't know the human aspect of Mike. You were able to get that out of him. Describe to me that first moment of when you met and were able to talk to Michael Jordan about this process. That was September of um, 2017. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was the 27th because because it was, for some reason, I remember it was two days before my birthday. Right. And it was sudden. I've been dealing with, with um, his manager and his main business partner, Esty Portnoy and, and Curtis Polk, uh, for about eight or nine months leading up to that. So, uh, and they had been adamant that I, I need to get in front of Michael and get with him and just get comfortable with him. He wants to get comfortable with me before he goes forward. Because when you're sitting down with someone for, you know, discussing some pretty personal stuff and, and go, going really, really deep for three long interview sessions, it can't be someone who's a complete stranger. I mean, I'm not a friend of Michael, but at least I'm not a stranger by the time we sit down. So I met him uh, in the lobby, of, in the, like a lounge in his hotel for the first time. Uh, he was with his wife and I came off the elevator and, and um, I just saw these long legs sticking out from behind this pillar and I was like, whoop, <laughs> here we go. And it's surreal because, first of all, his hand doesn't fit in, the, it's huge right. hand. I can imagine. And I've met NBA players, obviously, and pro wrestlers and stuff, but this is a different level of just like, his, it's just like jarring how big his, his features are. Right. Um, and he was kind of in the dark, so he's, it was low lit, so he's sitting back and I can just see kind of the outline of his head, so the bald head like nodding at me, and you see like a little glint off of his hoop earring. And we started talking about something really um, that he was passionate about, and he leaned up and he pointed his finger at me like this and was saying, like, who's the, he, we were talking about the Hall of Fame speech. Yes. And he said, who do you think the only person is who knew what I was trying to say? And his, his finger is, is like two feet long and it's got a big bend in it because he's gotten it back so many times. And that's the first time that I was like, whoa, holy shit, that's Michael Jordan, right? I'm actually talking to Michael Jordan because. He's got such charisma and he's such a, a, a normal guy behind when the cameras are off that, you know, it, it just feels like any kind of normal conversation. You know, we talk about Mike's competitiveness in a, such a legendary fashion. A lot of times people say that what is the singular thing that separates him from the other legends in the game. Were there any topics where you can see that competitive fire kind of come out whenever you were interviewing? Oh, of course. Um, and that was one of the one of the, the techniques that we employed was, was giving him that iPad. Mm -hmm. And we used that, you saw that in episode one with his mom, and that was to elicit, you know, a sense of, of wistfulness and nostalgia right. um, to try and get him to talk about what it felt like to be a freshman in those days before he became Michael Jordan. Uh, but you'll see it employed in different ways later on in the series when I'm handing him an iPad and it's not his mom, it's Isaiah Thomas. It's not his mom, it's Gary Payton. It's not his mom, it's Reggie Miller. And you can see him, it's like a time machine. It just goes bang and he's right back into being Michael Jordan of the 90s. Right. He, he, he takes that iPad as, as 56 year old Michael Jordan, 57 year old Michael Jordan. By the time he hits play, he's back to, to 30 year old Michael Jordan. Sure. So so, right there. So it's safe to say that that kind of tension with the bad boys Pistons is still kind of there. Oh, I said, uh, was that, I, you'll see in episode three, I said, how real was the hatred uh, between those two teams? Because I think today we're used to like, teams are rivals and then you see these guys on a banana boat and it's like all right well you didn't really hate each other like you're competitive and all that but you're trading jerseys and and that's what it is today so how authentic was that back then and he said oh i hated him and that hate carries to this day <laughs> that's that's incredible that's mike right that's that's mike um on social media there's this notion going around that the only reason that mike might have greenlit this in this documentary series was to kind of end the debate about the greatest of all time between himself and LeBron James. For you personally, do you feel like that was the sole reason that Mike kind of was okay with the last dance coming out? Only he can answer that, but but um, just pure conjecture on my part, I think that that would come from a place of insecurity and, and Michael might be the least insecure person I've ever met. I think he's above the fray when it comes to that conversation and that's not to denigrate LeBron because he certainly doesn't. He, he respects the hell out of LeBron, but I think he doesn't care to have that conversation Partly because he has such respect for the people who came before him that he feels that it would be disrespectful not to include Jerry West and Bill Russell and even Dr. J and Marcus Johnson, people who, who 
came before him and were great and people who um, inspired him and kind of shaped his game because he, he uh, admired them so much. So I, I find it hard to believe that he's sitting there stewing and, and uh, wondering whether or not his legacy is going to be upheld based on, on LeBron's greatness. I think he's happy to witness LeBron being great. And I think it had more to do with just the timing. Michael's, Michael's very much someone who believes that if it's meant to happen, it will happen. Mm-hmm. And that came down to even um, his final uh, approval of me, they told me, is that like, it's, if, it's meant to, if he's meant to be in, in the city and I'm in Midtown too, and he's there, then it'll happen. Because I think so many great things have happened in this guy's life that it's just like, there's a higher power at work here. Right. I think it was just time and they got him on the right day and he said, all right, yeah, let's do this. It's been long enough. That's perfect. Um, you, you went through thousands of articles you, I read the story of you having like an 80 page word document of just different things. You had different folders for Isaiah Thomas, for Michael's mom, for Michael himself. But the thing that continues to impress people the most on social media is the music selection within this documentary, especially within the first two episodes. You started things with Been Around the World. How intentional were you with the music selection of The Last Dance Doc? A million percent. It, it's the most important aspect of any doc to me is the music. And um, long before we start filming a documentary, I'm, I'm walking around New York listening uh, to playlists that make me think about how we're going to tell this story and the kind of, not even that I'm listening to songs that we're going to use, but just something that gets me in that mentality. Back in the days of CDs, when we were going to shoot, I would, I would bring that big, a huge jewel case of CDs. It was like 156 of them. That was my carry on. And when I got in the rental car, I would drive around and just listen to music and think about how we're going to tell this, what's this going to look like. So it always comes from the place of music for me. And, and I, um, old school hip hop is, is that's that's my favorite genre of music. Uh, it's what's constantly playing. You can ask my girlfriend constantly playing in this apartment. Um, so this was an opportunity. I really wanted this to be a nostalgic look back at this team as well. So not to use even though I, I, I love these artists, but not to use a Kendrick or a Drake or a J. Cole or someone like that to tell the story of someone who was, who was back there in the 80s when it happened. So we tried to be, there's a few instances where we're not exactly right, but we're certainly in the era, whenever the era we're talking about, because I knew we were gonna go through different eras all through the, the series. So Been Around the World was, was in 97. And I think it came out like a couple of weeks after that Paris trip happened. So that happened then. I Ain't No Joke was was in 84, 85, or actually 85 it was released when Michael was a rookie. We act, we originally had I Know You Get Soul in there, but we couldn't clear it. So I Ain't No, ain't no Joke was our backup, but you're talking about a, a really good backup. But Rakim to me is, is he is the Michael Jordan of rap because he took it from, you know, what it used to be like James Naismith kind of like Peach Basket, basketball, that was kind of like the early rap, like, like Sugar Hill Gang rap. And all of a sudden, Markin comes out and it's like, this is still rap, but this is a different sport that he's playing. So it felt like they came on the scene at the same time and, and they were very analogous in their effect on their their two cultures. So that was really important to me to get Rakim in there in that first episode. And then on Bad, like it, it, I've known that song for obviously forever from when it came out. I think LL is wearing ones on the cover of that album. That's incredible. Um, so it just it just fit, and and we fought for that. It was really hard to clear. A lot of these songs are really really hard to clear. Old school hip hop is notorious, but you're gonna see as we go, and it's it's to the era. So in '92, the the Bulls repeat in, in in episode five. You'll see them repeat in the Shrug game and all that. I'm thinking, what was anthemic back in '92? That's not too obvious, but still is gonna catch people's ear if they know the era. Right. So they hear the choice is yours, Black Sheep. There's it's Beastie Boys, there's Nas, there's Lauryn Hill, there's Tribe, there's Special Ed, there's Outkast. You're gonna hear, a, a, I mean, that's my favorite kind of music and it was such a joy to put this in this project. For you personally, what's your favorite episode of this documentary and what are you? What episode are you excited for fans to, to see? Well, the, the bad answer is every single one. I love them all. I know you're not looking for that. I love Seven. Um, I think that that Seven has some moments in it, uh, specifically the ending of Seven, I think is gonna catch a lot of people's attention as just like raw Michael Raw's it gets. Um, and 10, we ju- tomorrow we are finishing editing 10. So it, this is like a baby that hasn't been born yet saying it's my favorite child, but um, 
it might be it might be um, recency bias, but it, it's the final 20 minutes of episode 10 might be my favorite 20 minute stretch from when game six and 98 starts until the closing credits might be my favorite 25 minute chunk of the entire series. So I'm really excited for people to see that. What do you feel like personally this documentary can add to Mike's legacy in your personal opinion? I don't know about a legacy because um, I think that his, he's written his legacy already. And it, it, this is more of a reminder for right. people. But, but if there's two audiences that, that I want to really resonate with, it would be the people who saw him play to be reminded of the joy that he brought them when they saw him play and to learn something new that they didn't know. For even Jordan fanatics who think they know everything there is to know. And I'm sure there's going to be people who say, there's nothing new here, I know it all. But most people don't know a lot of these stories. But even for the people who thought they knew everything to, to hopefully learn something else uh, factually, but certainly about him, to, to peel away a few of the layers of this guy who's just known as this fierce competitor and win at all costs, you know, gym rat kind of mentality. He's a father and he's a son and he's a brother and he's a husband and he's a good friend to a lot of people in this doc. So there's a lot more to the human side of Michael that I hope people see. And for the younger generation, you know, my nephew wears Jordans, but he just knows Michael as a logo. Right. A YouTube clip. But I hope that this really shows people, like, it struck me, because I just, looking back on it, it's easy to say, like, ah, oh, they won six out of eight. Right. They were dominant every year. It was almost like death taxes and the Bulls in the finals. It was like, yeah, they could be there. Every single season, they went through some real hardships, and this was not easy. It's never easy. It's always harder than it looks when you achieve anything great. But this, especially, I hope people appreciate it. That's incredible, man. Jason, I'm looking forward to each and every episode. I'll be tuned in each and every Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Yeah, man.